Good afternoon and welcome to the third session of our full morning webinar series by the Institute of International Monetary Research in collaboration with the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. I'm Dr. Juan Castañeda, Director of the Institute of International Monetary Research, and tonight I will be hosting uh, Dr. Marcel Magnus, who is a banking expert working in the European Parliament. In his current position, he supports the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, providing expertise on bank supervision and bank regulation, and he regularly publishes on those topics. Marcel previously worked for several years in the Task Force uh, Financial Crisis of the European Commission, handling a number of high profile bank restructuring cases and participated in core hearings at the Court of Justice to defend the decisions uh, taken. As a member of the Troika team for Portugal, staffed by the, the European Commission, the ECB and the IMF, Marcel analyzed the performance of Portuguese banks and the country's banking sector. Uh, the European Court of Auditors recently appointed him as an independent expert for its uh, advisory panel on state aid to financial institutions. Before joining the European institutions, Marcel worked for one of the big four audit firms, having initially started his career as a researcher at the University of Constance. Marcel Magnus will discuss today banks uh, capital ratios, minimum requirements versus supervisory requirements. Both today's presentation and the Q&A session will be uh, recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. And you can go to our website, mv-pt.org, to access this uh, presentation and other webinars in our series. So, uh, Marcel, thank you very much for uh, kindly accepting our invitation. We're very happy to have you uh, here on board, uh, even though remotely, and we're looking forward to your presentation. So, the floor is entirely yours. Thank you. Well, thank you Juan, um, for the kind invitation and uh, the very kind introduction. Um, it's actually my pleasure to take part in this webinar and um, I hope it works fine because I have not run this uh, set of slides before. It, um, um, yeah, I'm pretty confident because let's say I'm quite familiar with the topic ECB banking supervision. That's my, my topic for, for, for today. And um, I should mention uh, one issue right away. I'm, of course, talking in my personal capacity. So um, this is not the official line, and, or at least not necessarily the official line of the European Parliament. And, um, and if I'm talking about ECB banking supervision, it would also be fair to say that the ECB as such might also have a different view on that. But um, I can give you, let's say, my my view on um, the um, relevance and reliability of ECB banking supervision. That is what we what we do um, in our in our unit. We assess that. So I would maybe come to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, here we go. I just um, wanted to show you as a scene setter um, the structure of what I would like to talk about, and that is I would first like to talk about the relevance of banking supervision from client or from an investor perspective. I would then talk briefly about the institutional setup because we've got the European Central Bank on the, on the one hand and we've got the European Parliament on the other hand. And that might seems, seem a bit, let's say, uh, unusual for, for some. Uh, and uh, I would briefly explain what our relationship is I will then come to the supervisory review and evaluation process. That's one of the core functions of uh, the banking supervisor. I will explain that later on. And then I can, in the end, talk a bit about uh, regulatory capital requirements. Now, if we go to the next slide, I would ask hypothetically a question to the audience, and that is, um, imagine in the, in the context of the, of the current corona crisis, um, who would you would uh, consider to be a safe bank? So if you were asked to recommend a bank from which you or somebody else would like to buy bonds, who would you pick? And I've listed some criteria that will probably be, be familiar to, to most of you. Um, so 
the reputation of the bank or the size, the credit rating, the capital ratio, or what is called the capital add-on or pillar two requirement. Now, you don't have, I think it's good to make, to briefly think about it. You don't have to tell me, but let's say from my point of view, all of those criteria could be justified, maybe except for reputation, because that's a fuzzy concept. But all the other criteria could somehow be justified. Um, and at least three will be familiar to all of you. Size, credit rating, capital ratio. I think that is something everyone knows. But not many people might know what the capital add-on is, the pillar two requirement. And I would like to demonstrate that on that this might also be an interesting criterion to decide whether or not a bank is sound and safe, because that is what banking supervision is all about. The banking supervisor has to make sure that banks are safe and sound. And so we could now come to the next slide. And here, I will just briefly explain what the institutional setup is. You will probably know that some years ago, in 2014, the European Central Bank was made the banking supervisor for the most important banks in the euro area. Um, they have not necessarily opted to become the, um, the banking supervisor for the largest banks. But there was um, um, a widely shared perception that the, during the financial crisis that started in 2008, that the national supervisors have failed to do their job properly. And uh, the reasons that were cited was that the national supervisors had a too cozy relationship with the, with the, with the largest banks that they have not solved problems, but swept them under the carpet. And so the idea was basically to tackle that problem by taking banking supervision out of the hand of national supervisors and to put that into the hands of the European Central Bank. Now, the ECB exercises that task in an independent manner, very much as in the um, area of monetary policy. And as in the area of monetary policy, the ECB is also accountable, accountable specifically to the European Parliament, which means in practice that they have to come to the European Parliament and defend and explain the actions they have taken. I will explain that in a second in, in a little bit more detail. What is nevertheless very important to know, um, there is a difference between monetary policy and banking supervision. And that is, banking supervision is to a very large extent law enforcement. So um, as a bank, you are not at all free to do what you want, but you um, are working in a highly regulated area. And um, you have to deal with lots of um, rules and regulations. You have to respect them. And the task of the banking supervisor is to make sure that those rules are followed. So that explains why uh, banking supervision is to a large extent law enforcement. Um, I would now come to the, to the next slide. And here again, I, I would briefly talk about the institutional setup. So we've got the uh, ECB that is in charge of supervising the um, largest banks in the euro area that are around, around about 120 banks. And, um, and the relationship with the European Parliament is that um, that the chair of the uh, European Banking Supervisor, so 
sort of the um, uh, the boss that he has to come to the parliament uh, on a regular basis and to explain and defend the actions they have taken and he does that in in, um, in, uh, in a specific committee of the of the European Parliament, that is the Committee of Economics, uh, Economic and Monetary Affairs, or short form is just ECOM. Now, as you can imagine, um, banking is very often about sensitive issues, and so not all of the issues that are, um, that the Parliament would like to discuss with the supervisor can be discussed in public. So while you could take part in these public hearings, you can also follow them online. They are web streamed and recorded. So there's a public part and there are these so-called so in-camera uh, hearings or meetings, which basically means um, they are behind closed doors and that's where you can discuss the more sensitive issues. Um, the parliamentarians can moreover write specific questions to the ECB and the ECB has to reply to all of these questions. Um, the European Central Bank, they will send us their annual report in which they also explain what they have done. And they will finally send us the minutes of the board meetings. But um, they again contain sensitive information, which then in practice means they are classified and they are kept in a vault in the European Parliament and there is very restricted access uh, to those um, minutes. But nevertheless, we received them and so you will now understand our job as the um, um, permanent um, employees of the European Parliament is to prepare the parliamentarians for these um, accountability hearings. And that is, we analyze a lot of information that is sent to us, to the, to the Parliament, and we also analyze individual accounts, we analyze um, financial statements, we analyze the information that is um, disclosed by the European Central Bank. And based on that, we prepare the parliamentarians for these hearings. That's, that's our job. Um, that is um, a bit of an uphill struggle um, because in Frankfurt, where the European Central Bank is based, there are around, around about 1,000 people working on banking supervision. And um, you can imagine that there is a lot going on. Um, on our side in the Parliament, we are a comparatively small team of two people doing that. Bottom line, and that's the key takeaway, the institutional setup is that the European Central Bank is in charge of um, uh, supervising the banks. And our job is to make sure that the ECB is doing a proper job as regards banking supervision, better than what the national supervisors have done in, in the past. And with that, I would come to the next slide. And here I would also just briefly explain one aspect that is important um, because there is in the European Central Bank a strict separation between monetary policy and the supervisory responsibilities, responsibilities because you can basically cover up for shortcomings or um, actions that have not proven useful if you um, if you look away in the other area in, in concrete terms that means uh, for example you can um, hide the unsustainable funding situation of banks if you grant those banks um, an easy access to ECB liquidity, for example, or you can, um, um, if, you, if you talk about monetary policy and the low interest um, rate environment, um, um, you, would, you might not like to talk about it 
um, what the effects are on, on banks because it poses certain problems for banks. So in principle, monetary policy and supervision are strictly separated. Now, what happens in practice is if the chair of the supervisory arm of the ECB, if he is asked during those hearings what he thinks about the low interest rate environment, they will typically say, well, this is not, uh, not my, um, my, um, my remit and um, uh, he will try not to, to give an answer. Although in theory, he should. He should be able to speak out and say what from his point of view the effects are and whether or not it is good that there is this sort of low, low interest rate environment. That's at least the idea of having this um, clear separation in the, in the ECB. Um, what might also be important to point out is that the European Central Bank as a banking supervisor, it, they are no legislator. So, um, they are um, um, uh, that they cannot actually um, set up new banking regulations. That's for the European Parliament. And we had uh, a sort of a clash between institutions in in one um, specific area. Uh, about two years ago, the ECB tried to to define the level of provisioning that is required for non for non uh, non performing exposures because there was clearly a lack of uh, uh, rules and regulations in that area so they said well there have to be common common rules for that and they uh, they wrote um, guidance on that and that's basically where the European Parliament stepped in and said, well, that's not your job. You can take a decision on individual banks, but as soon as there, there are rules that apply to all banks equally, that's um, legislation. And that is something that is not your job, that is our job. Okay, so um, the banking super advisor, they, they have to make sure that the um, that the legislation is followed up and they have to, to make sure that uh, all the rules are implemented, but they cannot create their own. I will come to the next slide, please. On that slide, I wanted to give you um, a brief summary, sort of a job description of what the ECB does as, as a banking supervisor. And they um, are in charge of issuing or withdrawing banking licenses, they can or and they are involved in the appointment of the bank's top, top management. They have to take a decision as regards which bank is supervised. That's the significant status because we def the, um, uh, differentiate between significant banks, the largest banks in the euro area and those that are not significant and it's Basically, the, the European Central Bank actually um, um, can also decide upon that status. I will skip the next point for a second. I will uh, just mention the macro prudential buffers. It's also something that falls into the remit of the ECB as a banking supervisor. They are involved in stress testing and uh, in case banks do not follow the rules, they would also impose sanctions. In any case, in most of those areas that are mentioned here, they will do that in cooperation with national um, authorities. But there is one task for which they are um, exclusively in charge of, and that is the so-called supervisory evaluation process. And that is something I would uh, like to explain maybe on the next slide. Um, because the, um, I mean, maybe need to, to, um, to summarize first, the supervisory review and evaluation process basically means that the, uh, the European Central Bank as a bank supervisor um, has a specific look at the individual risk profile of banks. And um, they 
as an outcome of uh, that process, they will define specific um, they will define specific capital requirements. You may have heard at the beginning uh, or early on that uh, in the context of the Corona crisis that people said, well, we don't have to worry about the banks right now because they are so much better capitalized than in the in the previous crisis. Um, so um, what makes banks safe is really the amount of capital that they hold. Um, and the amount that the capital that the amount of capital that the bank needs to hold has two main components. One component is what is described here on this slide. It's called the pillar one capital requirement. Um, and it basically means the following. Um, the, the level of capital that a bank needs to hold is simply first of all, driven by the underlying credit risk. So you would basically take all the assets that a bank has and you will multiply it with a certain risk factor. And I've tried here to give an example. Um, um, for ex if you, for example, hold a portfolio of Chinese sovereign bonds, you would have you would um, first look at the credit rating of China, which is A plus, which basically means here you would multiply the portfolio uh, with um, 0 0.2. So let's say a portfolio of 10 million Chinese sovereign bonds would translate risk weighted into a portfolio of 2 million. And then you would have to multiply that with the minimum capital requirements of 4.5%. And so you would end up with a capital requirement of 90,000 euro. That would be the capital that you need to hold as a bank for the portfolio of 10 million Chinese sovereign bonds. So that's a very simple way. Um, oh, I've chosen here a very simple example because the, the rules are extremely detailed and the, um, the rule book uh, for the capital regulation, it has more than 300 pages. So I'm really, really making um, it uh, simple here on that, on that slide. But um, let's say the, the takeaway is that if you have two different banks with an identical portfolio, the pillar one capital requirement for those two banks would be exactly the same because it's only driven by the assets that you hold. And if I now go to the next slide, and then you will, uh, I will want to illustrate what the pillar two requirement is about because one part of the capital requirements is only driven by the assets and the other part of it is the individual risk profile of a bank. And that is where the ECB as a banking supervisor um, comes into play. So what they do is they go to the banks and they look at the, the way this bank is run and governed. So they look at the business model, they look at the corporate governance structure, they look at the risk monitoring, and so they do um, what they call a holistic assessment of all the strategies, processes, and risks. And as a result thereof, they will then um, define what is called the capital add-on or the other terms for that are the pillar two requirements or in short form P2R. So while two different banks would have with the same identical portfolio have exactly the same capital requirements under pillar one, they might have a very different capital requirement under pillar two. And that is only defined by the ECB. So that's really the core of their banking supervisory uh, evaluation. And if I, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and what they do is they put 
with the assessment, they put banks into different what they call risk buckets. So on this slide, you will see they put them into theoretically into four different risk buckets. The, none of the banks is actually in the one with the lowest risk that is empty, but there are banks that are in the risk bucket two, three or four. And with an increasing risk profile, it basically means you need to hold more capital. Um, yeah, that's a comparison between 2017, 2018 and 2019. It's overall in that period rather stable. If you go to the next slide, please. So basically what you see is that the ECB puts them into different risk buckets and basically means the riskier a bank is, the more capital it needs to hold. And I mentioned earlier that we need to prepare uh, parliamentarians for this discussion with the ECB. So what we do is we, for example, analyze aggregated data. And on that slide uh, that I hope you can now see in the presentation, I compare two different um, bar charts. And what it would tell you, for example, or let's say the way I would instruct the parliamentarians for the discussion is that if I look at the first circle that I've not, uh, with the number one, I would, for example, tell them, OK, um, you'd see that there are overall not many banks with the highest risk factor. So it's the, the number is comparatively small. It's just uh, 10 10 percent and even decreasing over time, which is good. The other information would be if, if I then look at the other bar chart on the right hand side that um, in terms of risk weighted assets, um, uh, there are even fewer banks um, with the highest risk factor, which just tells you the risky banks are smaller than the average. That's basically the information you can take, take from that comparison. But where we would tell the parliamentarians that they should ask questions is that if you look at circle three, you would see that in the past, so in 2017, a quite considerable part of the risk weighted assets were in the um, low risk bucket. And over time, they have shifted and, and migrated to a higher risk. So that is simply something that needs explanation. Yeah? And of course, when we do these comparisons, we, on the one hand, we first start with the information that the ECB uh, provides, but then we go on and compare that to market data. And um, because they, it could also be that the ECB simply doesn't spot some things in the market, at least theoretically. They are, of course, well, much better informed than we are. In any case, I would now go to the next slide, which um, tells you something else. The, um, on the one hand, we need to know how much capital you need to hold in order to run your bank. That's the capital requirement. And if you look at this chart, you'll see this is the, the, the lower line, um, or the, the bottom part basically of the chart that shows the range of capital requirements of all the banks that are supervised by the ECB. The, the dots show you the actual amount of capital. And that's, of course, very interesting to see that there are some banks where the actual level of capital is very close to the, the requirement, while there are other banks which have much more capital than what is required. So they are much safer, to, to, to put it simply. They are much safer. And in the end, what this chart tells you is they are not all the same. Some banks are really, really well capitalized and they are arguably well prepared to withstand a crisis. And other banks are definitely not as well capitalized. And so they are really close to what they need to have. OK. Now, um, one can also talk about credit ratings. Now, for the time, for the sake of timing, uh, I think I would skip the next slide, which is about credit 
rating agencies because we typically compare, let's say, what the ECB does with credit ratings. But I will um, now explain a bit um, what you see here because what we have to make sure is we, let's say, our job is to supervise the supervisor. Okay, so what we do is we compare um, the judgment that the bank supervisor has given on specific banks with those that credit rating agencies have given. And here in this um, in this drawing, I'd say from our point of view, it's perfectly fine if both the bank supervisor and the rating agency says where well, there is low risk. Okay, that's that's perfect. We also um, happy if the bank supervisor and the rating agencies both both see a high risk. So both give a caveat and say, okay, just be cautious, which is also fine for us. What is a pity is if the rating agency says there is a low risk, but the banking supervisor says, well, there is risk in, in so So that's a pity, but it's not our concern. So this is not what we really care about. What we care about is that there are no cases where the bank supervisor sees a low risk and the rating agency sees a high risk. That is where we would definitely challenge the ECB, where we would tell the MEPs to, to question the bank supervisor. And in the end, where we would really tell MEPs they need to question the bank supervisor is if there are cases where a credit rating agency says there is um, high risk and the banking supervisor doesn't see any. That's um, the cases that definitely need to be avoided. So what is that we do? We, and if we come to the next slide, please. Here I show you the, the type of analysis that we do. So um, we calculate the correlation between the credit ratings um, and the pillar two requirements. And what we, for example, found is that there is 0.5 correlation, meaning that around about 25% of the variation is explained. It also tells you that um, credit rating agencies and bank supervisors do not look exactly at the same things, because otherwise the correlation would be higher. They do look at different things, but there is a notable correlation. And if you look at that um, analysis, you will see there are no cases um, where uh, banks would have um, 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 a very bad credit rating, um, very, very bad credit rating by a credit rating agency, but still a low um, pillar to buffer. Those cases simply do not exist. So it gives us comfort that overall the banking supervisor uh, does a good job. And I would now come to the to the last uh, two slides that I want to talk about before taking questions, because um, in the end, I still want to make you aware that um, one, um, let, let, let's say that neither credit ratings nor um, the pillar two requirements will give you 100% security, whether or not a bank is safe. Now, the, the case I want to just briefly mention is it's one of the banks that went belly up uh, not too long ago. Um, it's the case of Banco Popular. It was the fifth largest bank in Spain at that time. And it had a credit rating um, of BA1, which uh, if you're familiar with the scale means it was rated as just non-investment grade. So it was, from a credit rating point of view, there were an early warning signal. The capital ratio of that bank was 12.1%, which was just slightly below average. Not too bad, but not a strong indicator in any case. Now, if we talk about solvency, the, the interesting point is that it was always extremely difficult to find out what the actual 
capital add-on for a bank was because the ECB has not disclosed the information and banks were also very reluctant to do so. And uh, in the, on that slide, I have just taken um, or cited one part of the financial statements based on which you could recalculate the, um, the buffer that they were asked to hold as pillar two requirements. And in order to do that, you have to have and have to, to take into account a lot of additional information about um, the phasing in of capital conservation buffers, counter cyclical buffers, um, other systemic risk buffers, etc. So it's you have to be very familiar, let's say, with all the details of banking regulation in order to find out what it is. What we figured out for that bank is um, the pillar two requirement for Banco Popular at that time was 2.75%, which is among the highest um, capital add-ons that the uh, ECB hands out. So bottom line, and coming back maybe to the first slide I mentioned, if we think about criteria that give you an indication as to which bank is safe and which bank is not safe, for Banco Popular, we had two early warning signals that the situation might be very difficult for that bank. What happened is that this bank really ran out of liquidity. It has then been declared failing or likely to fail by the European Central Bank, which basically means they kickstart a resolution process. All of that had to happen very fast. Um, they were lucky because there was already a potential buyer on the spot. It was Santander. They have taken over that bank and um, that is what, what happened in re reality. However, on the last slide, I'd like to point to the real problem, and that is um, why I would call some of the criteria that we can use, um, I think they give a, a false impression or they, they might create an illusion of safety. Because what we've seen, or what we see on the last slide is a comparison between, on the one hand, the equity amount that the bank, that Banco Popular had at the time and a provisioning shortfall. You can calculate the amount of equity that um, Banco Popular held by multiplying basically leverage ratio with the balance sheet exposure. And um, if you multiply those two, so 150 billion, uh, roughly with 5% leverage ratio, it gives you an equity amount of approximately 7.5 billion euro. That was the equity position. On the other hand, the buyer, Santander, disclosed the next day after it has taken over Banco Popular in an investor presentation what the provisioning shortfall was. And the provisioning shortfall for that bank was 7.9 billion which basically means that all of the equity was gone from one moment to the next. So there was no 10%, 11 or 12% capital ratio. It was once the, the accounts have been corrected, it was completely gone. There was zero capital left. And, and that's, I think, something that's very important to keep in mind because as long as the auditors do not make sure that the accounts are correct, um, all the criteria that I mentioned before, whether it be the credit rating, whether it be the capital ratio um, displayed or the pillar two buffer, they all would create a false impression of, of safety if the accounts are not correct. Um, that's the point I wanted to make. And now I'm really happy to take questions if there are. <laughs>